Looking back at the grid frustum shader, we note that the size of thread groups didn't have any particular meaning other than simply telling the API how many threads need to be executed in order to get as many frustums as we need to cover the whole screen. Each thread represents one tile on screen and therefore calculates the planes for a single frustum. In the light calling shader, however, a thread group represents one tile and each thread within the group will be a worker which will do intersection testing for the same frustum as the other threads. If we use the same group size as the tile size, then each thread also represents one pixel on screen. Using the images from the source material, we see that we have a buffer that contains an array of light calling light info with light position, direction, range, and so on, are basically all the data that we need for intersection testing. Then we need to have another buffer that contains the light indices of the lights that affect each tile. For example, here the first tile has three lights with indices 2, 1, and 3. The second tile has one light with index 0. The third tile has two lights with indices 5 and 6, and so on. This buffer can be used in the pixel shader to index into the light buffer and use only the lights that affect the tile where the pixel resides. However, when using only this buffer, we don't know where a tile begins and how many light indices it has. Therefore, we need another buffer, which represents a grid that contains this information. This grid has the same dimensions as the grid frustums buffer, since it has an entry for each tile. Each entry contains two integer values, the first of which contains the offset of light indices for this tile within the light index buffer, and the second integer is the number of light indices for this tile. For example, here we see that the first tile starts at offset 0 and contains 3 indices, the second tile starts at offset 3 and has 1 index, and so forth. We can summarize the light calling shader with these 5 steps. First, we need to initialize group shared data. Group shared memory is memory that can be accessed by all threads within the same thread group. This makes it useful for storing intermediate results that don't need to persist between frames. Next, we need to determine the minimum and the maximum depth values for all pixels within the tile. As I explained in this video, this will complete the six planes of the frustum, after which it's ready to be used for intersection testing with lights. To do this, each thread will take a light and intersect its bounding volume with the frustum that belongs to this thread group. So the first thread will test the first light in the buffer, the second thread will test the second light, etc., until we either run out of lights to test, in which case we are done, or we run out of threads. In that case, we loop through the buffer so that each thread can examine multiple lights if needed. When all lights have been tested for intersection with the group frustum, we end up with zero or more light indices that we need to write to the light index buffer. Before doing so, we update the light grid entry that corresponds to this tile with the number of lights and their offset within light index buffer. Finally, we write the indices to light index buffer at that offset. I'll start by explaining the intersection functions so that we understand the shader code that I'm going to write next. Consider a plane with normal n and distance d from the origin. We define the space where the plane's normal is pointing towards as the positive half space of the plane. Everything in this space is in front of the plane. The objects here are also said to be outside the plane. In the opposite direction, we have the negative half space, where the objects are inside or behind the plane. In order to determine if a sphere is outside or inside a plane, we first project its center point onto the plane's normal vector. This is a simple dot product that returns a scalar value, which is just a distance of the projected point from the origin. Subtracting the plane's distance d will give us the signed distance of the sphere's center from the plane. If this distance is less than negative r, where r is the sphere's radius, then the sphere is fully inside the plane. Note that we can test if a point is behind the plane using the same equation if we set the sphere's radius to zero. We can write this equation as a function in our HLSL code and use it for intersection testing with frustum planes. 
Let's again consider the same plane, but this time we have a cone that has a tip at position T, height H, and a base radius R. We can also define a unit vector D, which we can use as the direction of the cone. Then we can define another point Q on the cone's base, which is farthest away from the plane in the direction of N, if the cone is in front of the plane. When the cone is behind the plane, Q would be the closest point to the plane. The cone is inside or behind the plane when both T and Q are in its negative half space. We already have the position of point T, so we need to calculate the position of Q and use these equations to check if they are both behind the plane. The first step is to acquire a vector that is perpendicular to both plane normal and cone direction vectors. We can get this from the cross product of plane normal with the cone direction. In this presentation, this vector is coming out of the screen towards your eyes. Next, we calculate a second vector that's perpendicular to this cross product and the cone direction, which is again calculated using a cross product. We call the resulting vector m. You can determine the direction of a cross product using the right hand rule as shown here. We find Q by starting at cone's tip, walking H units in cone direction D, and R units in the opposite direction of M. Note that we used the minus sign to reverse the direction of M here. Now we can write these equations in our shader code. As I explained in the previous episode, a cone is not a great bounding volume for spotlights anyway, so let's have a look at how we can construct a sphere that envelops a spotlight as tightly as possible. Here we have a spotlight with a range and a cone angle between 0 and 90 degrees in both directions. We can construct a bounding sphere using this equation, which is the light range divided by 2 times the cosine of the cone's half angle. However, as you can see, when this angle is larger than 45 degrees, the bounding sphere starts to blow up and goes to infinity for a 90 degree angle. We can solve this problem by using another equation when the cone angle is larger than 45 degrees. We can get this sphere by multiplying the spotlight's range by the sine of its cone half angle. Here we see that this isn't a good fit for smaller cones. However, when the cone angle passes 45 degrees, it becomes the best fitting sphere. So for the cone angles less than 45 degrees, we use this equation and for larger cone angles, we'll use this one. 